For many of you, you don't need an introduction to Patricia Berman, but for those of you who might, she is the Theodora L. and Stanley H. Feldberg Professor of Art at Wellesley College, as well as professor at the University of Oslo. She has curated or co-curated numerous exhibitions in the US and Scandinavia. Early in her career, she worked closely with Kirk Varnado on the landmark exhibition Northern Light, Realism and Symbolism in Scandinavian Painting, 1880 to 1910, which toured the US in the early 1980s. Her vast knowledge of Scandinavian art was invaluable then to that exhibition and has been invaluable to the ASF since then. And in 2011, she was co coordinating curator for our centennial exhibition, Luminous Modernism, Scandinavian Art Comes to America, 1912. Dr. Berman also has a number of other ties to the ASF. She actually received two fellowships from us when she was working on her dissertation in the 80s. And since 1992, has been a member of our Committee on Fellowships and Grants, which selects the current recipients for, uh, to, that are given to scholars and researchers. And since 2012, she has been an advisory trustee of the ASF too. So after the talk, she will take some questions and then she will, you'll have a chance to have a glass of wine and meet with her informally and also go up and see the exhibition. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Patricia Berman. Um, it's hard in this, you know, in, in 2013 to see the Prince of Edvard Munch in a fresh way. Um, you know, the scream has just been at MoMA. There was a big Munch retrospective in 2006. There have been Munch exhibitions all the way through. His prints are reproduced all over the place, particularly the lithograph, the scream. And it's hard to see them as new images. It's hard to not see them as sort of iconic or as repetitious or as things that are pre-digested. Oh, seen that, been there, done that. But, and, and I have to include myself in that because I've been studying Munch's work and his prints for going on 30 years, um, thanks in part to the American Scandinavian Foundation for their fellowships and their generosity and support. But I have to say, in working with this exhibition and in working with Andy Warhol's um, interpretations of Munch's prints from 1985, um, I see Monk in a very fresh way. And I want to thank uh, Andy Warhol, and I want to thank Perry Stave, my co-curator, from whom I've learned to see in so many ways. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit this evening about uh, Monk's prints, about Warhol's prints, about Warhol and Monk, Warhol and Warhol, and maybe Warhol and all of us um, a little bit uh, toward the end. But I'm showing two self-portraits. One. Uh, by Andy Warhol on the left and the other by Edvard Munch on the right. And of course, as the exhibition announces in its um, first didactic panel, and as we say in the exhibition catalog, and as every the reviewers have kindly said, um, up until now, you often don't think about these two artists in the same breath. You think about them on the opposite ends of the sort of commercial and psychic spectrum, with Warhol as the sort of commercial, repetitious, factory-driven um, capitalist who cold-heartedly pulled in every single possible image that came across his path, appropriated it, and spit it out again, particularly in the 1980s, his final decade. And then you think about Edvard Munch in his self-portrait here from 1895 uh, as this sort of isolated, depressed, northern genius who couldn't see outside of his own boundaries and continually took the journey inward to produce his images and tried desperately to communicate with the public. But I want to say at the beginning of this talk, and as we try to indicate in the exhibition catalog and in the exhibition, both artists were aware of what was inside. Both artists were aware of their, uh, were deeply self-aware. Both artists used their personal experiences in coded ways to create their work. Both artists were market-driven because Munch himself helped to create a print market for himself, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, both artists uh, were very involved in uh, masking themselves with their public personae and built public personae that were very, very complex. And they were working about a century apart, of course, and Munch, uh, in fact, helped to generate a public um, art, a public commercial art world working the gallery system throughout Europe um, in the 1890s and thereafter. Part of his market strategy was making prints and repeating the images and transmuting the images and re. Um, re-circulating uh, the images over the course of about 60, 50 years, 50, 60 years, and he actually set many of the terms by which Warhol then began to work when he entered the commercial art market um, in the 19... 
60s. So there are more similarities that we might know of than differences that appear on the surface. The two artists, though, met, one, I guess, meeting the other posthumously. Um, in 1982, there was a significantly large retrospective exhibition of the works of Edvard Munch, mostly prints, but some paintings. Um, the Gallery Balmain, which was on 57th Street here in New York, it was a short-lived gallery that held a major exhibition of Munch's work in the fall of 1982, which included about 125 works by the artist, which was as large as any museum exhibition of Munch's work that had been in New York for um, about a decade or more. Um, Warhol visited this exhibition on 57th Street a couple of times, and then apparently, uh, toward the end of the run of the exhibition, he went into a contract with the gallery directors, one of whom was uh, Scandinavian and the other uh, American, to create a series of paintings based on four of Munch's prints. And the four prints that Warhol selected for this job of uh, making appropriations were um, this print that's entitled The Brooch, also know, uh, of the um, violinist Eva Madocci. It's a portrait of this woman artist from 1903, Monk's Madonna uh, from about 1895 and thereafter, Monk's self-portrait with skeleton arm from 1895, and of course The Scream, also from 1895. All of these are lithographic works, although sometimes people look at this one and think it's a woodcut because of the particular uh, linear structure. So Monk was, uh, Warhol was given the opportunity to choose four images and then appropriate them and make them into large-scale paintings, multiple colored paintings, which he then did. And um, in choosing these four images, and again, just slightly larger views, you know, there are, we don't know the reasons why, Munch, uh, why Warhol chose these particular images. One could guess in any number of ways. I'm going to make some guesses this evening. The more I've thought about them, the more I see associations with Warhol's retrospective work and his um, interest in contemporary uh, images and ideas outside of this historical uh, world of printmaking. Although I think the historical world of printmaking and these prints by Munch had particular resonance for him too, which we'll talk about. So he created this series entitled After Munch, first a series of paintings that he created in 1984, 15 paintings which were sold almost immediately. And then um, after those paintings were sold, Warhol was commissioned to create prints based on the paintings. And the idea, and so these are, these are some of the prints that are in the exhibition. Warhol's version of the brooch, Eva Madocci, his uh, marriage or you know, partnership contract here between uh, Madonna and Munch's self-portrait in one printed image, and then the screen. So as I said before, when you go to the gallery, if you have gone to the gallery, they're all trial proof, so they're, indiv they're singular um, experiments with the different color combinations that you see on each of the image, or images. Originally, they were going to be issued, the idea was, and the contract was to issue these as portfolios uh, with each of these images in, in a single portfolio, but the portfolios were never um, issued, and after the gallery dissolved, the gallery was only um, around for a brief time, Warhol purchased the contract and the idea was that he was going to issue these as a portfolio um, himself, but then after he passed away, the prints just remain as singular images. They've been exhibited in Europe. There have been two significant exhibitions of these works um, in 2010 in particular, one in Denmark, one in Norway, but this is the first time that a group of these images that Warhol produced have been exhibited in New York where they were originally produced. In the 1980s, <coughs> Warhol was, as many of you know, in the late 70s and 80s, receiving commissions to do appropriations of historical artworks, of the work of Leonardo da Vinci, um, the work of, um, of Matisse, of Picasso, of here, Giorgio de Chirico, and I'm showing you two works out of a series uh, that Warhol produced in 1982, in which he took works by late, uh, late works by de Chirico, and then multiplied them in um, single images, and then um, exhibited them first in Italy. And um, of uh, Piero Fran della Francesca and other historical artists. So he was receiving these commissions often by art dealers who would then commission these series uh, or give him the ideas for the series. So the images that he produced 
um, of based on Monk's work are among those and among those many, many appropriations. And it's possible and probably likely and important to liken them to the works of Marcel Duchamp because in a way as Warhol um, appropriated these images, of course, he was using them all as sort of ready-made images, as pre-produced, pre-digested images that he would then re-digest and then reissue. So in a sense, just like uh, Duchamp modified uh, Leonardo's uh, Mona Lisa here in this, um, in this uh, ready-made or modified ready-made from around 1919, Elash O O Q, this kind of famous um, game with the idea of reproduction and dissemination, right? Modifying and maybe, and you know, making a little mustache and a beard and writing in French, she has a hot behind underneath this image by Leonardo. There are many different ways that Duchamp was commenting on Leonardo's image and the fact that it was reproduced so widely and the fact that here what Duchamp did was um, took a really cheap re a reproduction of Leonardo's image and then made a commentary perhaps on the reproduction. The fact that when we see an image disseminated throughout culture so much, we no longer see it as a, itself as a, an invented idea, but we now see it as a reproduction, as something flat that circulates uh, widely, that we can digest ourselves in, a, in many different ways. So in a way, when Warhol took on these images, he was doing just that, these very widely publicized, widely reproduced images by Edvard Munch, the signal uh, isolationist, right, of the 1890s. When he appropriated the images, he did a number, Warhol did a number of interesting things. And the first is that Monk's prints, as you see in the gallery, this is a, a colored version I'll show you again in a moment of the scream, Warhol's image, uh, Monk's images are small and dark and intimate. And they're all, lithic as I said, lithographic images. There's one um, intaglio print up in the gallery, but they're very, very small. And they're intended to be small. Monk worked in many different scales over the course of his career from images that are this big, like almost on a cigar box lid to paintings that are, that are um, uh, 36 feet in, in width. So Munch was capable of working on many, many different scales, but for many of his prints he chose intimacy. And the images that he produced, particularly in the 1890s, were rather dark in, in, um, in value. What Warhol did was, of course, blew them up tremendously in scale, and the paintings were, the original paintings were on this scale in relation to the prints, and then the printed images in the gallery more or less on this scale, vast, so taking intimacy and making it public. Taking a dark, uh, dark imagery and actually making it light and airy and then bright and jarring. So these are some of the changes that he made. And in terms of his strategy, what Warhol did to make the prints um, as many of you know, because there are a number of print curators here, so I sort of feel naked in public talking about this in front of artists and printmakers. But was um, he began by taking, to go back to this, um, reproductions of the print. So let's just take the scream as an example. Took a reproduction of the scream, not the original print itself, but a catalog that had reproduced the image in kind of four color separation. So there's a dot matrix on the surface of the page. Took that print and then had it re-photographed, blew it way up so that the image started breaking apart and then you could see the little dot uh, structure now written large on the surface of the prints. Um, and then once this was blown up large, what Warhol would then do was uh, to trace the image on a sheet of mylar or acetate um, to uh, then, you know, trace the image and to draw out some of the details for the image and to suppress others. So when I am interested in this idea of multiplication and division and subtraction, it's really how Warhol then manipulated Monk's original images. And so, and we'll talk about this one a little bit later, what he did and what he did not do to take um, the original image with fidelity and to blow it up. So he traced and then made um, silk screens out, uh, created matrices out of a series of, Im of um, different matrices for the background in different colors, and then um, which were based on the original print, and then overprinted it with his own drawing. So that what you see when you see the prints themselves is a blown up reproduction of Munch's original print, divided up into different colored zones, and overprinted with different colors of of um, silkscreen ink, and then on top, almost like graffiti, it are Warhol's lines, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, 
when Warhol did this procedure of blowing up and photographing and re-photographing and tracing and then re-blowing up and then um, attaching these different um, acetates onto silk screens and then running ink through them to create these multi-layered colored prints that Warhol did. He wasn't, of course, doing this alone, but he was doing this in collaboration. And as you know, Warhol collaborated with many, many artists and um, other um, people who would come into his studio, the factory, or many of his factories, and would work with him and sometimes do his printing with him and for him. But since 1974, for about 10 years, uh, Rupert Jason Smith, who is a Florida-born, um, New York-based artist, uh, was Warhol's master printer. Rupert Jason Smith had, I'm sorry, I don't have a photograph of him, but um, I'll explain this in a second. Rupert Jason Smith had his own printing workshop separate from Warhol's own studio factory. So he was his primary off-site printer. And when he would pull prints for Warhol, he'd, use, he'd create these uh, silk screens and then make the multi-layered prints. Often that was done with um, tangential conversations with Warhol. And I'm looking at Reva, I'm making eye contact with Reva Wolf that it wasn't necessarily always Warhol making the decisions about which, what exactly to do, how to proceed. Possibly Rupert Jason Smith had a very big hand in choosing the different variations in these 90-some or more um, individual images. But this kind of collaboration, this kind of dialogue, and whether Warhol chose the color variations himself or Rupert Jason Smith took some creative control, this kind of collaboration between a master printmaker and the artist um, is nothing new. And in fact, Edvard Munch himself collaborated with numerous master printmakers all over Europe, actually, in his own lifetime. And I'm just showing you uh, the, the, uh, one of the great um, steam-driven dri presses in the studio of Auguste Clot in Paris. And I'm showing you a print by Pierre Bonnard and a print by uh, Munch, a portrait of, of uh, the poet um, Mallarmé. Uh, which were created by Clo in his press. And occasionally when Munch was in Paris, he would be in Clo's studio telling Clo which colors to use to create layered colored lithographs. And other times he wasn't there, but he would just write in to indicate what he wanted printed. So this idea between the master printmaker who's actually pulling the prints and making decisions about quality um, and about which colors to use in which order, sometimes were creative processes by the, printer the printers themselves. So it wasn't just Warhol off-site, um, you know, the machine, factory-driven man not touching, but this was constant, um, this was a constant among artists. And I'm just reminding us too of the work and the studio of Pierre, of, of, of um, Auguste Rodin, who um, is credited with creating you know, thousands and thousands of marble and bronze uh, figures that populate world museums. And he probably, he himself, with his own hands, produced very few of those. Because by the time he was in, sorry, his last, last years, Rodin had an enormous workshop and had a number of artists working for him and with him to actually produce his works from maquettes. So this idea of the artist touching, producing, making minute by minute decisions about individual works of art isn't necessarily the case with Warhol's works or with Munch's works, just to say that this is one of the things that is standard practice and was standard practice in the production of modern art, particularly from large um, commercial-based studios. And Munch's studio in many ways was a commercial-based studio because Munch himself only had an art dealer or two art dealers working on his behalf for about three years out of about a 60-year career. The rest of the time, he was his own dealer. And he arranged his own exhibitions. So this was part of his business practice. So with that said, the fact that the artists were working in collaboration with master printers, that the artists understood um, the, were themselves printmakers, but um, often would um, sort of um, off, uh, create off-site prints. Um, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about each one of the prints that Munch produced and then what I see potentially Warhol seeing in them and I think the things that help us to see Warhol freshly through, uh, Munch freshly through Warhol's eyes and maybe Warhol freshly uh, through Munch's prints in some ways. The Scream is a print that Munch produced in um, 1895. I'm showing you a hand-colored version and uh, Munch 
uh, would tend to experiment very widely with his prints. Munch became a print ma ma maker in 1894, the year before he made The Scream. He was originally living in, he was living in Berlin. He was trying to make it as an artist. He was kind of starving and desperate to make money. He had had some success with his exhibitions until then. But in 1894, a couple of art historians, um, one was a museum curator, one was a writer and art historian, Germany's most preeminent art historian, in fact, Julius Meyergrafe, convinced Munch to begin making prints because they suggested to him, and this is in the letters to Munch, that um, if you make printed versions of your paintings, more people will see your painted motifs, and prints are inexpensive so you can sell them and make money. So Munch thought that was a grand idea. But also, as Munch would tend to do, he'd pick up any medium that was offered to him. Printmaking, he tried his hand at sculpture, photography, uh, monumental painting, uh, certainly oil painting. He, whatever he took on, he began to um, examine in tremendous depth and reinvent. And this is what he did with his printmaking. He began making lithographs in 1895, and the scream was one of the was among the first of his motifs. And of course, the image itself, now based on you know, the exhibition, many of you have probably seen at MoMA that just closed about a month ago. It's like a catechism at this point, right? Uh, Munch. Um, created the first version of the scream in 1893, and it's a mixed media uh, composition on cardboard, and it's based on his memory of uh, walking along a pathway on the eastern side of the Oslo Fjord, at the time the Christiania Fjord, uh, overlooking the city of Christiania, which is now Oslo, the capital of Norway. And his memory of this night in 1891 was that he was walking down the road with a friend and the sun began to set and he wrote in his uh, creative day books that the sun, the sky turned red and he said, no, the sky turned red like blood. No, the sky became blood. And I fell to, I fell to my knees and I felt a giant scream pierce all of nature. So this is what he s saw on this walk. This is what he remembered. Um, it was painted two years after the event, or after this memory entered into his mind. And um, it began as a series of sketches, as I said, that he did in his creative day books, along with this writing, this feeling of the feeling of a, sh of a scream piercing all of nature, not hearing it, but feeling it with his body. And then he created the first image in 1893. Um, when that painting, and he exhibited it in that year, after he um, exhibited this painting and it was sold to a private collector, as he was about to sell it, it was commissioned, actually. Um, another version of it was commissioned by a private collector in Germany. And this is the image, uh, this is the central feature in the Scream exhibition at MoMA, this pastel version that he created in 1895, along with a little prose poem underneath that is written in his handwriting. Um, of this moment of experiencing the great scream in nature. At the same time, around the same time that Munch was commissioned to make a copy or a repetition for a private collector, um, he also made this lithographic version. And in many ways, the lithographic version is as closely based on the pastel as it is on the original mixed media. Uh, composition. And in this one, Munch has translated color, and much of the power of this imagery comes from its perspective and its color, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but what he's done is translated color into pure linear form. So he's created vertical lines, um, some horizontal lines, some roving lines, lines that look like the knots in wood that twist inside one another. Each of these arenas of linear form in one way or another representing a different sort of colored zone in the original. So he translates color into form. He then in the lithographic print wrote the title, Geschrei, or the scream in German, so that the title of the work accompanies the image just so you get it. And just so you get it even more, he's written the prose poem, I felt a terrible scream pierce all of nature underneath. So you've got the image, you've got text, you've got a bit of an explanation. And so buying the print or seeing the print, collecting the print, meant you were sort of collecting the experience. And what's really important here for Munch, for the collectors of Munch, is it's the I. I saw, I felt, I experienced. And this became an important touchstone in Munch's career because collectors and critics began to see this as a self-portrait. 
I felt a scream pierce all of nature. So rather than a motif with a semi-abstracted figure in a semi-abstracted landscape, it becomes Monk. And in the Monk literature over many, many years, of course, this now is the self-portrait, although it is not. In, uh, sorry, this was, cop this was um, copied in 1895, but the painting was sold out of Monk's private collection in 1910 to a collector. Sorry, it wasn't sold in 1893. In 1910, when Monk sold the painting, he made a copy for himself uh, in oil that's now at the Monk Museum in Oslo. The original is at the National Museum in Oslo. And then there are two other um, uh, pastel versions. So what Monk did was created repetitions or multiplications of this single image that went into various collections and then were dispersed widely both um, through this lithograph and then through reproduction in the mass media because the image was reproduced in, in everything from socialist newspapers to fine arts journals, even during Monk's own lifetime with his permission. So there's a, Monk was already deep into the multiplication and rep, repetition business even in 1895, around the age of, of 30. Um, Monk then, in creating the lithograph, created it in multiple repetitious ways, uh, trying out different kinds of papers to see what the effect would be of printing this lithographic image on either purple or red paper. There's a, um, a purple version in Stuttgart and a red version in, in Boston to see what that would do. Um, he also created repetitions by sometimes issuing the print in its full version, as we have in the gallery here, sometimes cutting off the prose poem and just having the title, and then sometimes issuing it without any text at all. So that um, collectors of his work consciously collected one of each kind of thing. So not only did Munch reproduce and disseminate his works as a big market, but he also recognized that connoisseurs would want one of each. So that also multiplied his opportunities, but also created different ways of understanding the print. When Warhol saw the print and reproduced the print, um, I think he saw something, he saw so many extraordinary things in that print that I feel like I had lost over the years and maybe we have collectively. Um, it's hard to see the print through innocent eyes. But I think in some ways Warhol did. And what he did when he traced the print and uh, then blew it up large, first it was large, enlarged, and then enlarged again, Several things I want to call attention to before moving on. He traced the head and hands of this uh, abstracted figure with some degree of fidelity, and then he very carefully did not include a delineation of the body. So the body dissolves, which is one of the subtexts of the painting, right? The dissolution of the self in front of nature. So he saw a subtext that he grabbed. Another that he did, um, let's see if this works, no, um, well, when you go to the gallery, if you go to the, go to the gallery again, and um, notice that he double printed this image. So it's printed in black, and then it's printed in green. And what he did was he took the matrix, the silk screen, and tilted it just slightly, just by a few degrees, first printing the black and then the green just slightly so that there are, there's a dissonance in the images. They align in the center of the print, but the further up you look, and the further down you look, the more the lines seem indistinct. And you just feel like you're um, looking at something that's out of focus. So what Monk did, what Warhol did, um, was to create a kind of a visual dissonance in his overprinting of the same matrix twice, if you're following that. I had made an animation, but it doesn't um, show up on this computer. It would have shown up on my Mac, but I came too late to make that happen. But you can see it in the gallery if you're following what I'm saying. He then took the, of course, the uh, drawing that he made based on the tracing of Monk's prints and then overprinted it on these different zones of color that were printed underneath by Rupert Jason Smith, or Rupert Jason Smith did the printing. And what I said before about the print itself, the original, is that its power resides both in the line work or the color and the perspective in the original painting. And one of the things that happens in the Warhol prints as you go around the gallery is that each one amplifies a different zone of the painting, uh, of the original paintings or of the prints. So in one, you become aware of the sky. In another, you become aware of the walkway. In another, you become aware of the flesh um, of the figure. In others, the figure dissolves and is absorbed into the landscape. So there's a way in which each of these prints does some different kind of visual work. Um, that helps us to see the print freshly. 
And what Warhol did in one of the prints, the one that's at MoMA, and this co these colors are really off, here I'm honoring our print curator who's here, um, is that he uh, very specifically Warhol printed these absolutely out of registration. So that what you end up seeing is this sort of ghosted white set of lines overlaying the entire composition. He printed actually his matrix with his drawings a couple of times. So again, the lines are, are dissonant. And when you look at the print, it actually looks like it's in motion. And what that does, yeah, again, um, is this sort of overlaying of matrices, this printing out of registration, which actually amplifies the second subtext to Monk's image, which is that the thing is alive, that you're feeling a scream piercing all of nature, that this is a vital work. And in the painting, Monk couldn't quite achieve it in paint, in the print he couldn't, but I think Warhol did it tremendously by creating these out of registration prints. And of course, typically, printmakers do use everything they can um, to create um, prints in registration, and this is an industrial, oops, an industrial um, uh, silk screening mat uh, um, form, which includes several matrices in several colors that overprint one another in absolute registration. Um, what Warhol did was went out of his way again to create these figures out of registration, his prints out of registration. So what you end up seeing again and again are things that are more vital or that uh, uh, incorporate a new kind of ma um, reproductive vitality through visual dissonance uh, than Monk himself even created. So I think that there's a fresh way, an extremely interesting way in which Monk, uh, Monk's images uh, came alive again as Warhol understood the subtexts of, of linear invention and perspective, of the body dissolving, of the way that colors, dissonant colors, create visual authority and visual attention to the painting, and then made them even more dramatic in the prints. In um, the print entitled The Brooch, or Eva Medoci, to go back to what Munch did, this is one of the lithographs in the exhibition. Eva Medoci was um, a violinist who Munch first met in Paris in 1903, and the story goes that he fell for her in a big way. She um, was traveling with her partner, Bella Edwards, who was a pianist, and the two were a couple, and Munch was in invited by a friend of his to try to seduce Eva Medoci away from her lesbian relationship and make her fall in love with him, which of course didn't quite happen, but maybe it did, we don't know. Um, there's a woman, there's a nun, um, there's a, a, a woman who's, who's a nun here in the US who's, who may or may not be Eva Medoci's daughter by Munch. That's been in the literature for some years and a matter of some speculation and interest. Eva Madochi, however, is represented by Munch in this lithograph, could not be more beautiful or um, intimate or in many ways inaccessible. She's very close up, and yet her eyes drift off to the side. They're deeply um, shadowed within her eye sockets, and her spectacular cascading hair creates sort of waves all over the background. So at once she's close to us, and yet at the same time she's distant. She's lit from the side and slightly below, causing her face and her neck to pop out against the darkness. And then in the middle of it all is this large brooch and an, sort of an opening in her clothing, an arrow pointing upward below. And I'm showing you a second print that Munk created of Eva Medoci playing his own own self-portrait, somewhat like a violin, also wearing the brooch. So it's a portrait of an artist, it's a portrait of a musician, it's a portrait actually of a celebrity because she was a minor celebrity as she traveled around Europe. It's a portrait of a love object, it's a portrait of incredible glamour. And of course what Warhol did was punch this glamour piece up by you know, creating these multicolored highlights in the hair, multicolored lines that um, suggest her hair and that outline this uh, long neck and head. And in the, <coughs> excuse me, the tracing that he did, um, the, you know, the, the overprinting, the sort of graffiti that Warhol created for the print, he both um, picks out particular details of Eva Madochi's face and erases others to create a greater sense of uh, presence in her face and her elongated neck. And then in printing it, um, in many of the prints, uh, Rupert Jason Smith used what he called a rainbow roll, which is to say 
placing different blobs of colored in, um, ink, white, gold, yellow, red, orange, and white again, across the top of the screen or the bottom either way, and then running it down so that as he runs the squeegees, he ran the squeegee over the uh, openings in the print, different colors would come out across, making it even more sort of glamorous and multicolored and almost like disco lights, right, in, in the boom, boom, mid-1980s. And then um, he would also use in many of his prints, in many of these prints, um, these uh, sort of stencils that would either block out or help to amplify and add color uh, to different parts of the composition. And he was particularly creative in printing uh, in the prints that we have that Parry selected uh, for this exhibition of the brooch and Eva Madocci, because in this one, where there's like everything happening, right? There's many layers of color, there's rainbow roll, and then there's this funny kind of um, uh, series of geometric forms in uh, her head and in her, her throat. And um, what he did, I'm showing you this upside down, um, was to take the matrices and the, the stencils that created her, you know, the, the shirt upside down, the brooch upside down. So he took some matrices and turned them around upside down. So creating, therefore, this um, amazingly uh, inventive variable variation um, on this image of Eva Madochi of the brooch. So this was a print, and this was an image that had tremendous amount of um, experimentation within it, which is what Monk himself did with his prints. So it's, a, it's also an understanding of Monk's own processes, because Monk did some of these unusual things with his own prints. But of course, it's a glamour picture. And, and Eva Madochi, in her colorful form, joins many of the other iconic images of great beauties or great celebrities or images of power that Warhol was creating from the 1960s to the 80s. And women with hair. Um, I'm just showing these, you know, these um, um, uh, Polaroids of Jerry Hall from 1984, around the time that, Mo uh, that Warhol was creating his paintings. And then, you know, I'm out on a limb here, but loving uh, more and more um, associations between this print and Warhol's Brigitte Bardot prints from the 1970s. And one of the reasons why I like, I think about the alignment of these and Warhol constantly taking in and adding to and building on this enormous repertory of popular cultural imagery and popular recognizable faces and images that are pre-digested is the way that Brigitte Bardot was represented in the media. And of course, this is a, 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 a glamour photograph of her that's been uh, absorbed and reproduced uh, by Warhol in the 70s. But also because Bardot in many of her, she was of course like the, one of the ultimate sex goddesses of the 1950s, right? And one of the great uh, sex goddess uh, uh, fold out and calendar poses uh, for women over the course of the 20th century and even before was this, um, you know, this uh, almost like dying slave pose, this arm up behind the head, which pushes your bust. I'm re referencing Michelangelo here. That, um, dying slave, but um, arm up, hair tousled, bust pushed forward, right? It's a classic calendar pose. And I know it's really tacky of me, but the more I look at the pose of Warhol's, of Madonna and Warhol's uh, representation of Madonna, the more I think of Brigitte Bardot, who after all was supposed to be the original character in his film Sleep. But anyway, onward. Um, Monk, before making Madonna, before she was glamorous um, in Warhol's work, and I'll show that again in a moment. Um, this was one of Monk's best known and most widely deployed images. Monk created Madonna in 1895. It was based on a painting that he had made, and it was an oil painting in a wooden frame. The oil painting was of a woman um, shown, uh, according to his friends who wrote about it, at her moment of sexual ecstasy, as seen from the perspective of a man who was making love to her. So as we look at this print and we look at this woman in the center of this composition, either of them, um, our perspective of that is that of a man lying atop her and penetrating her is basically what this image was according to Monk's friend's commentary, not his own. Um, then what Monk did was did the painting and he exhibited it in a wooden frame that was covered with 
spermatozoa and a small or two small embryos. The wooden frame has been lost, but in 1895, Monk, or 96, Monk made this print in black ink on um, this version on a sort of a grayish cream colored paper, um, which incorporates both the woman and the original frame. Over the course of a couple of months, Munch began to experiment with this image, and he hand-colored it in different kinds of ways, and he kept going back to this stone. He began to make multiple stones so he could overprint uh, first in blue, a kind of a background that was actually, it's thought to be um, a blue cloth, which was covered in ink and then pressed down, and then a re stone carrying red lithographic ink, and then a stone with black ink um, on top, so that in the colored images you see both the woman and the frame, and then you also see the colored in version of a small crescent over the woman's head representing a halo. And of course, the title Madonna, in association with sexual commerce, couldn't have been more provocative in the 1890s, and it still probably couldn't be more provocative. And brought together, particularly in the colored version where you see this crescent, brought together is um, a representation of sexuality, a representation of biology, right, and a representation of theology. So it's a reinterpretation, a very fundamental way, of both the sexual act and about immaculate conception, according to this artist. What Mook also did over the years in playing with this print was to uh, reissue the print with many variations, and one I'm showing you here from the 19-teens includes many, many, many sperm cell, many more than the original, and then um, little pieces, tendrils of hair that he then painted onto the lithographic stone to create renewed versions. And in the gallery, we have many versions of the work, including a hand-colored version, and then one that Munch created also um, in the teens, which is uh, PG-rated, which doesn't have um, the sperm cells and the embryo within it. So this was a more acceptable version and could be exhibited in some places where this one could not be, and perhaps collected by some collectors who didn't want spermatozoa and embryos staring at them from their dining room walls. So he, was, he worked and worked and worked this image. He created multiple stones, and one of them was in, some of them were in Berlin, some of them were in Oslo, and he would call or he would write to his printers asking for more copies um, over the course of the teens, up through the First World War, so it's hard to keep track of what he actually produced. When Warhol Hole made his variation of this print, um, I think, so he saw some really fascinating things, and I can never see, I can never see this print the same way again. First of all, as I said earlier, he blew, he had this photographed, blown up, and in the blow up you see the dot matrix system of the cheap reproduction, which becomes part of the design, this kind of gray diaphanous background. And then he did the tracing, and he put the tray, he overlaid the tracing onto Munch's blown up print. In doing that, one of the things that I've always seen and that I think most of us who see this print imagine is that this woman's eyes are closed. This image is of closed eyes, uh, deeply shadowed by her eye sockets. But when Warhol drew it, he made her into a zombie. It's just wild. And actually, the more you look at the print, the wilder it gets. It's like an out of control image. And when you think about you know, Warhol's fabulous imagination, his love of the macabre and, you know, science fiction and, uh, you know, whatever, I'm having fun with this, his flesh for Frankenstein or blood for Dracula. Um, or I just keep, I can't stop looking at this uh, image by Richard Avedon of, and of John Lennon from 1968, which appeared on the cover of Look magazine and became a very widely selling poster in the, all through the 1970s. Uh, and then, you know, certainly um, following John Lennon's death, I can't help but see these sort of zombie, cool, fluorescent, psychedelic eyes um, in Madonna and in Warhol's Madonna as having variable associations, both with his own corpus and his own fascinations, and then with weird popular cultural images that may or may not have anything at all to do with Munch, but have everything to do with identity and the dissemination of identity through media imagery. And, you know, this is, you know, an art historian inventing something, but I've been looking more and more at this and Munch's self-portrait and these eyeballs and the fluorescent colors which show up neither in the print nor in the magazine covers. We see them on the screen, but are very much in alliance. And I, you know, I find it interesting. In any event, what Munch did was took Madonna with the 
weird zombie eyes and the spermatozoa and the embryo and created a single print side by side with his self portrait with the Warhol self portrait and he was doing this in a way that was almost like graffiti his own drawings on top of monk's drawings br or prints bringing monk's prints together and also in i'm just inventing but at this point i find it very interesting that in july of 19 1895 19 85, big scandal about Madonna, our New York-based Madonna, Ciccione, broke in the press because there were nude photographs of her that were released. And um, there was a collaboration between Warhol and Keith Haring modifying New York Post covers, right, and making uh, hash and kosh out of the popular press and Madonna's nude pictures around the same time that he was making the print. So I love the idea that Madonna Madonna has many identities and had many identities in, in 1985, as she did in 1895. So there was Warhol bringing together this, these two as a couple, a couple of prints. They're of different sizes as they lay side by side on the same large sheet of paper. And so you see them as reproductions, you see them as prints, but you also see them together. And the self-portrait, finally, I'm winding up the lecture, and I wanted to say a little bit about Monk's self-portrait, one of the signal images by this artist, and the self-portrait uh, by Monk that is most widely reproduced and most associated with him, other than the scream. In 1895, when Monk started producing um, uh, lithographs, this was one of the very first of three that he did, and this is his self-portrait with skeleton arm. Monk represented himself in these very delicate lines um, in, you know, in, in lithographic crayon on the stone, and delicate lines indicating the skeletal arm that has been severed from a skeletal body, and up above he's written his name and the date 1895, and some of the letters are reversed so that when you know, of, when you make a lith create a lithographic stone, you know that you're going to be printing a mirror image. And so if you're going to be writing, you have to write backwards for it to read forwards. And Monk got some of the letters wrong, so it's worth noting when you see the print. But what he did in making this print was um, created a body, or a head, a neck, and a very visible body. And the print that we have actually in the exhibition is the only known print that shows this. This is a trial proof. And so there are no copies of it anywhere. It's a singular image, so it's incredible that we have it in the gallery. He then looked at this, and he went back in and painted out the background, Munch did, um, on the lithographic stone using thick black touche. So he created a velvety black surround for this head, and suddenly, instead of a conventional head and shoulders self-portrait, it's a floating head in the middle of blackness, allied with the skeletal uh, remains of a dead body, and then his name, like a tombstone but it becomes a symbolist image. And it's an extraordinary one in which he's wearing a little collar that a lot of people have allied with a, with a priest's collar. Or it could be the collar of a gentleman who's about to go out but hasn't yet put in the separable white collar that you could see in public. It's a pretty intimate image of the self. And um, it was painted, or it was created, this both lithographic versions, about the same time Munch was creating an oil painting entitled Self-Portrait with Cigarette. Uh, which created a scandal in Berlin and then in uh, Christiania when it was exhibited in Christiania. This painting um, was seen as evidence of Monk's degeneration, of the whole Monk family's degeneration into insanity and illness. So a lot was mapped onto this that was then brought into this one, particularly in the, in the darkened image. One of the things that I've never noticed, and I think a lot of us who work with Monk's prints never really uh, tract is when you look carefully at the print, you recognize that Monk on the lithographic stone, when he pr created that huge field of black touche, took a stylus and made tiny little delicate lines, vertical lines, all over the background of the print. They're, al they're not visible at all in this reproduction, nor are they in almost any reproductions of this print, but go and look carefully in the gallery, and you'll see these tiny little lines that do a remarkable job in this print of stopping you from seeing this blackness in depth. It, visually and formally, these little lines keep pulling your eye back to the surface of the print, although you don't know why. But Warhol did. And when he did his version of Monk's self-portrait with skeleton arm, he took these little lines and he made them huge, and he made them eccentric, even some of them whiplash lines, like an Art Nouveau um, decoration. And so the lines themselves become critically important parts of Warhol's print, 
Whereas they were very subtle here, they become enormous and public here. And then in this particular version of the singular print, printed in aluminum, so that they're like silvery paint. So it's big, it's gaudy, it's metallic. It couldn't be more different than the dark introspective image that Monk created, and yet at the same time it is. It carries the intimacy, it carries the identity. And what I find fascinating about this image is the way that it carries Therefore, both it carries Monk's identity and it carries Warhol's. And this is the final thing that I would like to talk about a little bit, is the way that Warhol tipped his hand a little bit, I think, really dug into these prints, really understood them in a fundamental way, and in a fresh way, in a different way than most Monk collectors at the time, or certainly any Monk scholars did at the time, working on these images in 1985. I'm showing you a corner of this huge image in which you can see the dot matrix structure falling apart. So you've got Monk's print in the background, blown up. And then in the background, under all the silver drawing, is of course Monk's own rendering of his own face, overlaid with Warhol's rendering of Monk's face. So it's a double, one is a self-portrait, one's a portrait of Monk by Warhol. And what continues to be carried forward, though, is the title Self-Portrait After Monk. And it, I keep getting uh, trapped in this very interesting interplay between Warhol announcing this as a self-portrait after Monk and the print Self-Portrait by Monk. Because self-portrait after Monk, of course, is a pun and carries you know, potentially many nested meanings about who the self is that's being disclosed or who is existing on the surface here. Um, with the self-portrait after Monk and Madonna after Monk together in one image, of course, something else starts to happen. It's a curated little exhibition. He, uh, Warhol is curating two images, like you would in an exhibition, and bringing them together as a curator would. He's also creating graffiti on the surface of Monk's image, and that is much like what he was doing at the moment with Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, an artist with whom he was collaborating, just as he was collaborating with Keith Haring exactly at this time in 1984 to 1985. And the two artists together did a series of, did series of paintings in which one would create an underpainting and the other would create images overneath. So they were collaborating. They were together on the surface um, as, a, as an artist, um, as, as an artistic blending, as two people, as two self-imagers imaging together. And so I end up reading uh, these images of Madonna, or of the Scream, or of, um, of Eva Madocci, or of the self-portrait, again, as this, uh, likewise, a collaboration between multiple artists, or among multiple artists, Warhol's original, sorry, Monk's original, Warhol's overdrawing, and they're uh, mapping himself onto the surface, and then Rupert Jason Smith as the printer, printing all of them. So I see the coming together of many. And I also see it, uh, the two together, Madonna and the self-portrait, as an alliance, much as Jean-Michel Basquiat created this alliance of the two artists together in 1982. The story goes, uh, the day that they first met, um, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Warhol took a, a Polaroid of Basquiat, War, Basquiat took a picture of Warhol, scurried off, made this painting, a 60 by 60 inch painting within a matter of a couple of hours and then presented it to Warhol, who then began a collaboration and a kind of a competition with the young artist. So there's something about the two together, about doubling, the doubling of identity that I think is critically important in all of these Warhol prints after Monk, but particularly in the Madonna and uh, self-portrait together. And of course, these are, this is a series of, of Polaroids that were taken at Studio 54 around 1984, just a Paloma Picasso, and, and many, many others, this idea of the doubling, of the coming together, of the playfulness with identity, of identities that are um, malleable and mutable, that um, offer themselves up to the public in multiple ways, just as um, in Warhol's um, collaboration with Christopher Makos in 1981 to 1982, as he was um, offering himself in multiple ways um, in these pictures. This idea of doubling, of bringing together multiple identities, of creating um, a couple portrait, which I keep um, thinking about in terms of the history of couples portraiture, like uh, Jan van Eyck's um, Arnold Feeney wedding portrait, that there's something you know, sort of remarkable about the subtext of these two images, the desired woman 
and the isolated self brought together that I find interesting. And this is something Perry Stave recognized a long time ago that uh, was indicated in the New Yorker, um, the brief little review that the New Yorker offered of this exhibition recently, the recognition that many of uh, Warhol's self-portraits after Munch turned Munch's hair yellow, blonde. So that there's a remarkable trans transportation of Munch from his 1895 identity into 1985 and into the realm of ownership by Munch. And finally, as the two uh, are together in this spiritual, spiritualized self-image, self-portrait after Munch, Madonna after Munch, Madonna in 1895, Madonna in 1985, there's still, there's the child who appears, right? This cowering, pathetic little creature printed multiple times using that same out of registration image. So the creature is almost screaming in the way that the screen print was. Altogether, it is a way that I think um, these prints in the end reveal as much about Warhol as they do about Monk. And finally, in the back of our catalog, we use this particular photograph by William John Kennedy of Warhol holding up an acetate of Marilyn, hiding behind or disclosed through the portrait of another. And this is so much the way I see these, the, the poignancy um, of Warhol's adaptations of Monk. Not a mere appropriation, right? Not, not uh, Duchamp making a little mustache and a beard, although that's maybe one of the things that happens in this, right? A kind of graffiti on the surface, but also maybe a remarkable disclosure and maybe a disclosure made with some degree of pathos, very much like Warhol's retrospectives um, of a few years earlier. This um, grasp of his own past, a grasp of his past image, some of them reproduced on the surface of canvases and prints as photographic negatives, the obverse of what he's done in the past. In the end, I see the two artists together on the surface of these prints by Warhol. Warhol seeing things in Munch's prints that I think haven't been seen since Munch made them. Subtext that the artist himself probably put there that we have been too inured to the images to see for over a century that Warhol saw and is then offering them back to us again, both to see Munch freshly and then to see what Warhol saw, perhaps in himself and certainly in Munch. Thank you.